if you have any questions, you can raise your hand or ask on chat. If, uh, if Lara explicitly asks if there are any questions, then feel free to just unmute yourself. Um, so, great. So, looking forward to your second lecture, Lara. Please, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, Neil, again for the introduction and thank you uh, all the participants. So welcome to this uh, first of the second lectures of the summer school. So again, I'll try to share my screen. Yeah, looks good. Looks good. Okay. Um, I see a green line here. Do you see it too? Yes, I do see it. Uh, is that cutting off? Yeah, is it? Oh, uh, now that seems fine. Okay. Yeah. Good. Um, just forget to get the settings. Sounds good. So, do you see the mouse over here? Yes. Okay, perfect. So I guess we are set up to start. So uh, again, um, uh, welcome everyone to this second lecture and uh, let's uh, see some other uh, material regarding diameters of polytopes and in particular, as I said already yesterday, highlighted some interests that I personally found of particular, um, I mean, interest in a way. Uh, let's go back to a little bit to recap um, a few things that we mentioned yesterday. So we, we motivated kind of the study of diameter uh, with the performance of the simplex algorithm. The simplex algorithm we discussed it yesterday, very popular algorithm for solving linear programs. And in a way it is kind, kind of uh, combinatorial in nature. It exploits the fact that uh, if we want to simplify things, let's think about polytopes then uh, one could find an optimal solution on one of the extreme points. So the general idea is to start from one initial extreme point, And if that is not optimal, you pivot to an improved one, uh, improving one until the optimum is found. And we discussed yesterday that uh, a major open question in the discrete mathematics and theoretical computer science is whether there exists a way to pivot that actually guarantees only um, a polynomial number of steps to reach an optimal solution. So diameter is then a related concept. Um, what is the maximum length of a shortest path between two extreme points of a polytope? So because of course you need that to be polynomial in order to have a chance for the simplex algorithm to be polynomial. And yeah, of course, uh, when something uh, usually is difficult, uh, you might try to relax a little bit the condition in the hope of getting some insight uh, of, of the problem that you're studying. So one way to uh, kind of uh, relax uh, a little bit some conditions of the simplex algorithm is uh, maybe what if we allow some more uh, directions to take in each step. So in a way, this, uh, there were a few questions uh, also yesterday about this. So can we get new insight by enlarging possibly the set of directions? And in the literature, there are many ways in which this could possibly be done. And, uh, but I would like to uh, focus on, on, on this talk on one possible way. And one possible way is to look, for example, at the set of circuits. So what are circuits? Um, for a given polytope, the circuits are actually given by the set of all potential edge direction that can arise by possibly translating some of its facets. So let's have a look, uh, just to give an intuition on, on this example, and this in two dimension. So, okay, uh, in this example, if you consider this extreme point over here, now with uh, edge augmentation algorithm that we discussed yesterday, like, like the simplex, so we have two possible direction to take, right? We could go along uh, the direction that corresponds to the edges incident to, the, to this extreme point. On the other hand, circuits are given by all potential direction that can arise by translating facets. So if you see, if you take these facets over here and you imagine to translate it in such a way that it becomes visible to this extreme point, then now we have another direction that we can potentially take. 
And so you can see that, uh, of course, uh, this, is, uh, this is a relaxation in a way, it's enlarging the set of direction. So it might help to get shorter uh, paths uh, between uh, two extreme points. So in particular, if we look at this extreme point and this one over here, now this circuit allow, allows us to take a shortcut. And so here we could reach this extreme point with two steps while before we actually needed three. Okay, now um, circuits have actually a, a long history. They can trace back uh, to, to the 60s and they were introduced as elementary vectors by, by Rockefeller in 69 and as universal test sets for, um, for linear programmers by, by Graver. And there were also studies generalization of uh, Edmund Karp's rule for max flow algorithm to general LP. And let's say that in, in these years, circuit or circuit implementation algorithm have been appeared in several papers on integer and uh, linear optimization. And we are going to, to review some of this more. Let me say though that um, slightly instead more recent uh, generalization that uses circuits, um, uh, is in, uh, in a paper of uh, Borg, Park, Finland, and Hemmeke that formalized the notion of circuit diameter. Of course, it makes sense, right, uh, to use circuits not just from an algorithmic point of view, but once we have that, we could also, uh, you know, study structurally what happens to, to, to the path between extreme points. And so, in particular, the notion of circuit diameter is now the maximum value of a shortest path between two extreme points, assuming that it, any given point, you move maximally along any circuit. So as, I mean, here we have seen an example. Uh, in this case, uh, the shortest path between these two extreme points is, is actually two. So we are reducing here from three to two. Okay, so circuits uh, gives us more direction, so give us more power, but in a way they are also a bit more weird to work with because they, are, they do not uh, really preserve some combinatorial property that the normal notion of diameter have. In particular, polytope with the same combinatorial structure might have different circuit diameter uh, value because, for example, if you look at this polytope and you look at these two extreme point, then by using this circuit over here, you can actually go between this extreme point to this one is just one step. But if you stretch the polytope a bit, uh, you see that, that in this case, you don't really uh, go uh, to the same point that you were before. So in a way, the way in which you describe the polytope is going to affect the circuit diameter, which is kind of uh, less nice. Um, on the other hand, um, there are some interesting conjectures about circuits. So for example, um, uh, Borg, Parfino, and Hemeke conjecture that the circuit diameter indeed satisfies the, the Hirsch bound, so uh, number of facets minus uh, dimension. And if you remember yesterday, we said that there are some counterexamples to the Hirsch bound for the normal notion of diameter. And in particular, we said that there was this um, clear and World Cup results that uh, give a counterexample for the Hirsch bound for unbounded uh, polyhedron. And actually, uh, Stefan and you soon show that this example satisfy instead the Hirsch bound. So it is not a counterexample. And, and they showed it this independently on the way in which you uh, realize your polytope. So uh, in whatever way you are going to draw your polytope, uh, as long as it is preserved the, the combinatorial structure, the circuit diameter uh, there holds. Uh, for example, an interesting question instead that, that is, is open is what happens to Francisco Santos' example. Uh, because the point is that they are computationally the circuits like, uh, of course, they, they are way more than uh, the normal edge direction. And so computationally, it is, it is difficult to, to, to compute them. And so it's not clear whether that example could be turned somehow also in a counterexample for, for this other type of conjecture. And again, uh, circuits have been, um, as, as I said, exploited uh, so for both algorithms and for both concepts that relates to diameter. And there are more results about this. Uh, if you are interested, for example, in, in a recent development about this conjecture and all, uh, you can let me know when we will go to Slack. I can point you to some more, uh, more papers regarding this. And so they are an interesting subject to study on, on their own. On the other hand, uh, the things that actually interest me more uh, is again, whether we can, uh, I mean, 
whether we can view them as a tool to, to, get, to get some results with respect to the normal notion of combinatorial diameter and with respect to the performance of the simplex algorithm. So in particular, I found them interesting from two points of view. Algorithmically, uh, because um, the, I found it a nice question whether we can exploit this algorithm uh, to, again, trace back and be able to say something about the performance of the simplex algorithm, for example. Or in terms of diameters, and we also discussed this a little bit yesterday, whether this can give us some insight to address some long-standing conjecture, uh, again, with the, with the usual uh, uh, notion of diameter. So I would like to, to actually try to talk a little bit about these two things in, the, in this talk. And again, the emphasis here will be on LP defined as 01 polytope and related to this long standing conjecture, I would like to talk a little bit about the long standing conjecture about the diameter of the TSP polytope. So again, these uh, two things, they are a little bit more, uh, more combinatorial. And so I would like to, uh, I mean, the main message that I want to convey is that, um, I mean, these circuits could give some uh, actually insight to be exploited uh, to address uh, the problem in which you just look at edge direction. Okay, so, so far so good. Um, are there any kind of questions so far? Okay, then uh, let's start. And let's try to get a little bit more familiar with the notion of circuits. Okay, I'm afraid I cannot avoid to give the formal definition of circuits. Uh, that is as follows. So we can define circuit in, the, in this way. Actually, Lara, I do yeah? have a quick question. The name circuit, well, is there a reason? Oh, or this is going to come up right now? Uh, no, it's not going to come up right now. But uh, I mean, if you wonder whether circuit, uh, uh, there is some condition with the circuit with the, with the metroid, uh, then the answer is yes. Um, and um, OK, I'll tell you after the definition. Once I give you the definition, then I can tell you immediately why there is a connection with the circuit of metroids. Because there will be a connection with the linear matroids associated to the column of, of, of a matrix here. Good, okay. So, what uh, we are given a polyhedron on, on this form. We have some equality constraints, Ax equal b, and some inequality constraints, bx less than or equal to d. Now, we call a non zero vector g a circuit if the following two conditions are satisfied. So, g is a vector in, in, in the kernel. And if I look at BG, now this BG should be support minimal in the set BY such that Y is in the kernel, but Y is not non-zero. So I would like to take all vectors that are in the kernel and such that if I look at how they behave with respect to B, then they give me a vector that is support minimal. Support uh, uh, minimal really means I look at the elements that are non-zero and there should not be uh, another uh, vector whose support is strictly smaller than this one. Now, um, okay, one way, let's go back to, to, uh, to Neil's question. So if, for example, this I is the identity matrix, okay, so you just have AX equal B, then circuits can be made uh, to be correspondent to the circuit of the matroid associated to the column of this matrix, uh, matrix A, because they will just be the element with minimal support. If this is the identity matrix, then this is just saying that G itself should be support minimal. And they have to be in the kernel, so, so actually they would have AG equals zero. So the columns will be linearly dependent and they are going to be support minimal. Does it make sense, Neil? Yeah, thank you. Okay, good. Um, I, I, I think the, one, uh, one need a little bit of, of uh, time to parse this definition. I could try to give like uh, my personal view on this condition, which should, uh, should be support minimal. Uh, but we are going to see, uh, to see an example uh, uh, very soon. But anyway, just, I mean, my my intuition let let me try so um suppose that okay. suppose that that we have kind of a polytope here uh, 
Okay, and now let's take to extreme point and the edge between them, okay? So what happened to, to, the, to the edge uh, direction? So we discussed it yesterday, it is a bit, is that um, the edge direction is, is characterized by the fact that you have a lot of inequality of facets here that are tied for both this vertex and this other vertex. In particular, you have dimension minus one. I mean, yeah, in this case. So what this happens, was th what this means is that like along the points in here, you will have a lot of, of, uh, of uh, inequality that are going to be tied. Now, if you want to, to think about this, this direction as, as a circuit, right? So this, uh, this is going to be a circuit. What this means is that uh, when you move along this circuit, so along this vector, a lot of inequality here, that, that they should stay tight. And what that means is that for a lot of inequality, this should actually be, be zero. And that's one intuition that there is behind this support minimality. Um, yeah, as I said, uh, anyway, even if you don't want to pass this definition, think about them as, as all edge direction obtainable by possible translate uh, fa facets. And uh, I mean, these two, uh, definitions can be uh, proved to be to be uh, equivalent. Uh, yeah, I would say that a very good introduction about about this is in uh, Elizabeth Finnell's thesis that you can find actually online. Uh, one thing to notice is that, of course, the way I stated right now, if G is a circuit, then alpha G is going to be a circuit for any scalar alpha because if you multiply a vector by a scalar, this is still going to be in the kernel. And, and the same thing is going to be, to be true here. You are not changing the support. So in the literature, sometimes you find them normalized in some way uh, to turn it into a finite set. So if you uh, want, and actually this is the definition that we are going to use for most of this talk, um, you can say that, for example, you would only look at uh, vectors G that have co-prime integer components. And you can prove that if you do that, if, or you can normalize it with any norm, but as long as you do that, uh, then the set of circuits uh, become a finite set. And the reason is that, again, you can prove that if, a set, if two circuits have the same support, then they basically have to be the same circuit up to scaling. Um, okay, uh, in order to familiarize a little bit with this, uh, I think it would be good if we try to derive circuits for some uh, particular uh, polytope. And uh, yeah, what is our favorite polytope after yesterday? Well, I would say we can try to consider the fractional matching polytope. So let's see what we get here since um, we will learn a little bit uh, on its structure. So. Consider the fractional matching polytope, and let's recall from, uh, from yesterday, you have uh, this type of inequalities that are the degree inequality. They are saying that for every node of your graph, the sum of the value of the edges associated to the edges incident to the node should be less than or equal to one. And then you have non-negativity constraint, and this is a constraint that you have for every edge. Okay, now, suppose to have a circuit of this polytope. How does this circuit look like? So we are going to say, uh, now we are now trying to go to derive uh, some things about uh, its support. And in particular, I can anticipate that we are going to have a graphical characterization of circuit of this polytope. Okay, so the first thing is that the support of G, if G is a circuit, should induce a connected graph. Okay. Why is that, uh, is that true? So suppose that this is not true. So suppose that uh, if you look at G, uh, its support induce not uh, a connected graph. So maybe we have two connected components here. Now, again, one thing to notice, G is a circuit. So, so it is just a vector uh, that, that is basically in, in Rn. And in this case, N is a number of nodes plus number of edges, okay? So uh, we can think about this, the support in graphical sense because, um, uh, because again, 
there is a nice uh, characterization here. Uh, sorry, what did I say? The, 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 and here, the number of edges. So we can have, um, we can think about it in graphical sense because we can associate, uh, uh, I mean, one value to, to every edge in here. So suppose that this vector induces, as I said, for example, two connected components. Okay, then we can do the following. Uh, we, what we can try to, to, uh, to find is another vector, okay, that has actually a smaller support. Now, if this is true, then here the support of G, uh, sorry, is it a smaller support with respect to, to the constraints of this polytope. And so if this is true, then, then G cannot induce uh, more than one connected component. Okay, so let me be a little bit more precise because I was, uh, yeah, I, I said a little, a little things that were a bit confusing, I guess. So this is our set of, uh, of inequality. And remember, so if, if uh, we call B to, to be our constraint matrix, in this case, B is going to be equal to the matrix here that this is uh, basically an incidence matrix be between edges and vertices. And then we have the identity matrix that corresponds to the non-negativity constraints over here. Okay. And remember, if B, if G is a circuit, then when we multiply B with G, we are going to get a vector and this vector should be support minimal. Okay. Now, suppose that we have two connected components over here. Uh, we can try to find some other vector for which this quantity, the support of this quantity is contained in the support of, of BG. So we're going now to find another uh, vector G prime such that the support of BG prime is strictly contained in the support of BG. Does anyone see how we could find that? So first of all, uh, since we have here uh, the identity matrix, if I want a vector that has a smaller support with respect to my matrix B, I have to use only edges that are in this connected component. Because if my vector use some other edge, then the support here is going to contain another edge. And, and, and so if I want a vector that has a smaller support, I only have to assign uh, non-zero values to, to some of the edges in here, okay? Now, when I do that, I also have to be careful that I would like that if I look at each row in here, okay, if I have a non-zero value, this had to stay non-zero. Uh, sorry, if I have a non-zero non value, uh, then, uh, so if I have a zero value, this has to say zero. Otherwise, I would, I would uh, change my, uh, my, my support with respect to BG. Okay, so uh, let, let's have a look at this vector, okay? So in how many rows is BG non-zero? So BG in non-zero on the row associated to each of this edge, because, because this is a support, so it will have a non-zero value. So here for the edges associated that here are in black, the support of BG is going to be non-zero. Furthermore, I have a non-zero value for the row associated to this node and for the row associated to this node. Because here, my GE has a value, either positive or negative, so, and it's the only one. So I'm changing the sum of uh, GE for the E in delta V. I cannot say anything else on this other because the changing that might cancel out. Okay. Yeah, I was a little bit confused maybe, but what happens here is now we could think, for example, we could take, for example, this vector. If I look at this vector, so what happened? For which rows is, uh, is BG going to be non-zero? Well, here, because the sum of the edges uh, incident to this uh, node, if I take the GE, is going to be equal to one. Here, this is going to be equal to one. And then uh, I'm going to have three other constraints here for which GE is going to be non-zero that corresponds to these three edges. But so in particular, with respect to the vector before, 
No, I, I am changing the value for these two nodes as before, but these black vectors were changing the value also on these black edges. And instead here, I'm changing the value only on these three edges. Okay. So, so with this vector, the support of my BG was at least seven plus two. And here, the support of my BG is instead going to be equal to five. And it's not just that the change in the, in the number, it's just the support of this, uh, this uh, BG for this new vector, it's really strictly contained in the support of BG for this other vector. Do you have questions? Maybe can you just remind us, so we were looking for the vector was uh, small, where BG has smaller support, and then yes. can you just remind us the other conditions it was about? The... Oh, it was just that uh, the, if you have equality constraints, then, uh, then the vector should be in the kernel. But here we don't have equality ah, constraints. Okay. Yes. Uh, so there are no other, we just want smaller support of BG, nothing. Yes, so one thing to, uh, uh, that have to be clear, we want smaller support of BG. Uh, in this case, BG, also contains the identity matrix. Uh, so, so in this case, also the support of G itself, we can use it, but these two things should not be confused. We want the smaller support of BG. Yeah, and so, so G, anything non-zero, G must be non-zero, BG should have minimal support, that's it. Perfect, perfect. Okay. Anything that it is, that it is uh, I mean, that is zero here should also be zero in the, in the new vector. And then you look at how many of this inequality here for how many of this inequality here if you here put g for how many this sum is going to be non-zero and again on this black uh, vector this will happen for sure on this node for sure on this node and it will happen for sure on all the edges that are black and so i have seven on the other hand i can take this one and and bg will be non-zero for this and for this as before but now it is going to be non-zero just on these three edges and with respect to to the seven of before and so this shows that the support of g has to induce a connected graph okay uh, another thing we can say is the following if the support of g contains an even cycle then the support of G must be an even cycle. Okay, why? Again, suppose that this is your G. Now we know that it is one connected component, okay? And, and suppose that the support contain an even cycle, but it is not just an even cycle. It, it is uh, equal to, to something like this. Now, um, you can see that uh, for how many, uh, uh, rows here, uh, the sum of the G is going to be, once you multiply them by B, is going to be non-zero. Well, for sure, once again, in all these black edges. So you have for sure here that this, uh, if you put G, is going to be non-zero for these eight edges for sure. I mean, in this particular example, also in these two nodes, but here for sure is going to be non-zero on these eight edges. On the other hand, what could we do? We could do it as before, right? We could just take this vector, just on the even cycle. You see that, that for each of these nodes, the sum stays zero. So, so the sum of, for E in delta of E or GE, is going to be stay zero for all nodes in your graph. But with respect to before, we now have less support if we look at uh, this type of, of, uh, of constraints, because here, GE is changing on four edges and before it was changing on eight. So you cannot have in the support of G uh, an even cycle plus something else because otherwise you could find another vector that has a smaller support. Is this making sense? Yep. Okay. Now, um, another things about the support. If the support um, contains two odd cycles, then they must intersect into at most one vertex. So suppose that the support is like this and they intersect and, and you have two odd cycles, one, two, three, and one, two, three, four, five. Support, so suppose that they, in, like in this case, they intersect in, in, two, in two nodes, then uh, why this cannot happen? Can anyone see why this cannot happen?
I give you an indication. Just look at this. I see. <laughs> Is it? Okay. Okay. So. Yeah, someone yeah. has on the, uh, on the chat, people are. Uh, are writing? Yeah, because I don't see the chat. So you tell me. So they're. Uh, Asking, doesn't this create an even cycle? Very good, exactly. This creates an even cycle. And actually, I think I mentioned this yesterday too. If you have a connected graph and, 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 and you have, actually I mentioned it in a slightly different way, but if you have here a connected graph and two cycles that intersect in, uh, in more than one vertex, then you are going to create an even one. And so this is not possible, that's good. So if we have a cycle, we can have more, but they have to intersect just at one vertex. On the other hand, Support of G has to contain at most two odd cycles. Okay, can anyone see why? So I think by now uh, you should try to, to uh, get an idea of how this kind of proof goes. So what we did before, try to find another vector hmm, that is contained in these black edges, but is going to change the value for, uh, for uh, I, I mean, at least, uh, not as more as uh, the number of nodes for which this value was, was changing with this black. You tell me if someone in the chat finds something. I'm watching it. Let's Good. Wait a few seconds. So, uh, I will start. Uh, but, but then you tell me, you know, if, if someone gets it. So if support of G contains more than two cycles, like suppose you have three, they have a nice structure, right? Because this is a connected component, we already argue, and they are going to intersect into at most one vertex. Okay. Then we could actually take one and then connect it to a second one. Okay. And then what can we do on in here? Well, we could try to find, for example, uh, we could try to find uh, uh, some values that actually, uh, I mean, they, they have a non-zero value on these uh, black edges that only contain two cycles. And maybe we can try to find them in such a way that they are not, they are going to sum up to zero for all these vertices. If we can do that, then of course we are in the same shape as before. Like we are going, the support of, of BG for this new vector is going to be smaller with respect to this set of inequality and it's going to be zero with respect to this inequality. And so you cannot have something like this in your circuit. Okay, so one way, for example, would be to have this. Uh, you have one minus one minus one, here you have two and then minus one, one, one. So what happens if you look at every node the sum is sum up to zero so so here you will have zero for every node good and i mean this might happen also with this other uh, vector that we had before but for sure we are using less edges in the support so with respect to this inequality we're using less so that's good and now if support of g contains only one odd cycle Okay, then support of G can have at most one vertex of degree one. That's the, our, our last thing. And again, why is that true? Because once again, we could take our road cycle and we could connect it to one of these uh, two nodes of degree one only, for example, here. And again, we could assign this kind of value that basically are zero on all these nodes other than this one, here this is non-zero, but you see that also before this was non-zero. So we are changing uh, the value for the inequality corresponding to this node, but we, we were doing this also before. For all, all the others, this is going to sum up to zero and we're going to have less support. And uh, yeah, so you can try to have this kind of uh, intuition of circuit by playing a little bit with, with example, like the fractional matching polytope that uh, it's kind of easy to understand because it has this graphical uh, interpretation of, of your variables. And so now putting things together, there is just one last thing that we are missing. If support of G is acyclic, then it has to be a part. And now again, this, this should be easy to see. 
uh, if we have something that is that is is not a pot, then you have more than two leaves. So you have uh, for sure uh, more than two elements here from which the sum of the GE is going to be different from zero. But instead, if you can take here a maximal pot in here, then yeah, you are changing the value for this corresponding to these two nodes, but you were doing that also before. But now uh, with respect to this inequality, you are changing uh, the value for the less number of edges. And now basically we can summarize and we can get the following graphical adjacency characterization for the circuit of the fractional matching polytope. And, uh, and I think that this should remind something that we have seen yesterday. Like yesterday when we were talking about at the edges of, of the fractional matching polytope that, and the adjacency that we were using in the diameter, I had this kind, highlighted this kind of pictures. And now, yeah, I can give you a motivation on why I highlighted explicitly these ones, because actually if you take the corresponding vector in which you are in a way moving, like, like here I normalize we're having co-prime integer component, but if you take this kind um, of, of uh, I mean, the, the vector, if you explicit uh, the vector that you're using to move, uh, then uh, these are basically all the edge direction that you can have. And yeah, so I forgot to say, this is um, a joint work with uh, Jesus de Loera and my, my student, uh, Sean Kappel from University of Waterloo, Jesus is from UC Davis. Okay, so this is uh, uh, kind of interesting because it shows that for the fractional matching polytope, all the uh, possible edge direction that you obtain, even if you translate, are able to translate some, uh, some of the facets, they actually correspond to the actual edges of the polytope. Okay. Uh, uh, this is not typical at all, like usually you can get way more, but, uh, but for the fractional messy polytope, this is true, and maybe we will get uh, back to this later. Um, but actually, one thing that also I, I want to, to highlight is that yeah, uh, for the circuits that I forgot to say, uh, in this definition, one thing that uh, should be clear is that this definition is completely independent on your right hand side. And, and as to be expected, because like they, they correspond to all the direction that you can, can obtain up to translation. So translation means that they're going to change basically this, this right hand side. So this should not be affected by the definition. So a nice thing is that, that happens is, here is that, for example, if you set of the fractional matching, you consider the fractional B matching polytope in which the right hand side is not one, but it could be whatever. This is not going to make you gain any other uh, additional direction. These are still the, the, all the direction that you have, which, uh, yeah, might be something to, that one could potentially exploit uh, if you want to use perturbation to, to show hardness of simple, uh, hardness of diameter for simple polytope that we were discussing yesterday. Okay, so um, I hope that this was tied to try to give a little bit more familiarity with the notion of, of circuits. Even if this is not the case, don't worry, because for what I'm going to say next, um, um, I mean, you, you, this is not, not really so, so important at the moment. So let's try to have a look at some algorithmic aspect. So uh, among others, uh, the, the lawyer I am and Lee in 2015, studied some augmentation algorithm for rational LP. Actually, they, they consider them in a quality form, a standard equality form, that were based on circuits. And what they proved is the following. If at each step you move maximally along the circuits that yields the greatest improvement with respect to your objective function, then you can reach the optimum in weakly polynomially many steps. And this is in contrast with the simplex, because with the simplex algorithm, there is a counterexample that if you move uh, to, uh, to the, the neighboring stream point, that is the best according to the improvement that it gives you. There are examples shows that in worst case, this might take exponentially many steps. But this is said not true with the circuit. If each time you move maximally along in a circuit that you have the greatest improvement, you can reach the optimum in weekly polynomial in many steps. And I would like to give a proof of this. So, because actually it's not that, that, that difficult to see and it's kind of very nice. So we give you nice intuition about the circuit. So, I, I mean, as a first thing, I'm going to give a proof of this statement. Okay, to give a proof, we need to be a bit more formal. So, um, so consider an LP, this is in this form. You want to maximize the transpose x, a x equal b, and uh, like 
in this case for standard equality form X is between U and L, but, and without loss of generality, if we consider rational polyhedron, let's uh, rational LP, we can assume that all the data are integral, okay? So A, all the entries of A, B, C, and all, they're all integral. So what they proved is the following, is that using a greatest improvement rule, you can reach an optimal solution X star from an initial one X zero by performing that many circuit annotation. What is this? So uh, N here's the number of variables. Here uh, you have this term that basically depends on the difference in the cost between your optimal solution and your initial one. And it depends logarithmically in this difference. And then you have another dependency, which is delta. And what is delta? Delta is the maximum determinant of any n by n submatrix of the constraint matrix. Um, so here the constraint matrix uh, is, um, is given by A, this matrix A, and then you have the identity matrix here. You take any n by n uh, submatrix of this. This is going to have a determinant. You take the maximum of that, and, and that's what, uh, what is going to be to be inside the log, okay? Uh, but all of these, they, uh, I mean, they, all these terms, like they, they are inside the log of here. So you still have this weekly, uh, you, you are still weekly polynomial when you have this bound. Okay, now they, uh, they gave it for LP in a standard equality form, but, but really the results extend easily to LP of general form. So if you have AX equal B, BX less than or equal to L, then uh, really the same bound here holds. So actually I am going to give a proof in this more general setting. So we have AX equal B and BX less than or equal to L. Okay. So uh, again, the main goal is to try to, to uh, give the, the, the intuition behind this. So why is, where is this coming from? Okay, the proof relies on the following uh, property of circuit, which is called the sign compatible representation property that trace back to Graver in 75, which is actually uh, a nice uh, property that, the, that these vectors have, and the, which I think, I mean, uh, yeah, as, as, as students, like everyone, it's very, very interesting to know. So it says the following. If you take a, a, a vector in the, in the kernel that is not zero, otherwise things are trivial, then you can express this vector in this way. This vector is going to be a conic combination of circuits, okay? So far, so good. That have this very nice property. They are sign compatible with respect to with V with respect to your matrix B. B is the matrix of inequality. What sign compatible means is the following. If you multiply B and B, and you look at any coordinate J, then this is going to be greater than or equal to zero, if and only if you take GI, you multiply it by B, and this is also going to be greater than or equal to zero. Okay. Um, at the moment, this condition, as said, might not mean much. It just seems a condition on, on vectors. So, okay, I have a vector V. I'm expressing this as a conic combination uh, of, of circuits and I have this property that probably I have no clue what this property is saying, uh, maybe. But uh, let, let's try to, to see why this is helpful and what is this really saying. Okay, so express your vector x star minus x zero. So if you consider this is your optimal solution and this is your initial solution, okay? Now note that this vector is in the kernel of A because uh, x star is a feasible solution. So A x star was equal to B and x zero was a feasible solution. So A x B was equal to B. So if you say A multiplied by x star minus x zero, you're going to get zero. So this is in the kernel. So we can apply this property and we can express this vector as a sum of uh, uh, this circuit multiplied by some scalar. So this is a conic combination. Okay, that sounds good. Now, what happens is that if we have this, then the cost difference between the optimal solution and the deletion one can be expressed as a sum of cost and this uh, sum as actually n terms. So you can divide the total difference in costs that you have between your initial solution and your optimal one as a sum of costs associated to each of this circuit. 
okay? And now, what it has to be noticed is that for every of this circuit GI, the X0 plus alpha I GI is feasible. So no, I'm expressing this vector as a sum of vectors. And the thing is that each of these vector is feasible if um, give me a feasible solution if I'm adding that to X0. Why is that? Well, you have to work out a little bit here the, the algebra, but uh, we have the equality constraints and these are clearly satisfied because AX0 is equal to B because it's a feasible solution and GI is in the kernel. So this is clearly satisfied. And, and then we had the inequality constraint. The inequality constraint will say that for every uh, index J, if I multiply uh, this vector X0 plus alpha I GI, I, multi I pre-multiply this with B and I look at the J component, this should be less than or equal than LJ. And actually this follows by the fact that this vector are sign compatible. Again, you have to work a little bit the algebra here, but, uh, but since uh, B x0 minus uh, x star minus x0 is going to be greater than or equal to zero if and only if uh, this is going to be greater than or equal to zero for each circuit. And uh, basically this sign compatibility property gives you this. Uh, you can use this to show that uh, x0 plus alpha igi is feasible. That's, that's the, the main things about it. And let me try to give a more intuition if I can. We have a polytope here. We have X zero, which is our initial point, and we have X star, which is our optimal point. Now, um, what we are saying is here is that the vector X zero minus X star, which is this, can be expressed as a sum of some other vectors. And these are given by alpha I G I. So these red things in such a way that uh, these vectors here, they are inside our polytope. Because if we move from X0, according to this vector, we are still going to be inside the polytope. And in particular, I mean, uh, there are not that many of them because they are just N. So that's, that's the crucial property that, that you can derive using the sign compatibility representation. Is that basically the vector that brings you directly from X0 to X star, can be expressed as a sum of at most n vectors, and all these vectors are inside your polytope. And that's, that is quite nice because it means that in terms of cost, at least one of them would be, would be one over n uh, close to just your, your optimal solution in a way. It's carrying the cost of the, the, the portion of the cost here of at least one over n with this factor. So notice that you cannot have this property if you look at the actual edges of the polytope. Because here, from this extreme point, you only have these two edges over here. And if you would express this as a sum of these two edges, you have to scale them a lot. I mean, actually, this one is OK, but you would have to scale this one and, and this one uh, too. But it's clearly that you could, you, could, you could clearly see that you could stretch this polytope. And so this has to be scaled a lot. And instead, if we look at circuit, notice that this is actually parallel to this. If you looked at circuit, then you can always express this vector as a sum of, of circuit direction. And even more, these circuit direction are inside the polytope. It brings you, it makes you stay inside the polytope. Okay, do we have questions so far? Um, I, I hope I'm trying to give here uh, an intuition on what is happening. I've still not done yet, right? We have to see, this is just to say that we can express this vector as the sum. Now we will see how this implies a weekly polynomial bound. Uh, but so far, so good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. And other things. Uh, I'm not proving this clearly, but uh, but again, uh, this is uh, actually it's not it's not that difficult to prove, and actually it's a, it's a very nice statement to to know, of course. Good. So what are we saying again? We are expressing this vector, which is uh, the, the, the difference between our optimal solution and our initial solution. Uh, we are expressing this vector as a sum of at most n vectors using our circuit. And so what happens is that the cost 
Mm -hmm. The difference in the cost is now given as a sum of n terms, and each of these terms uh, is associated with its own cost. So what that means is that if you select the greatest improvement, then this yields roughly one over n decrees in this objecting function. So you have to, to gain this much objecting function to go from a zero to an optimal solution. And by taking the best circuit, you can get this decrease by a factor of one over n. So now it is not difficult to imagine that uh, if you repeat this, each time you are reducing this distance roughly by a factor of one over n, one over n, one over n, one over n. If you could add this, then after a number of steps that depend logarithmically on, on this distance and a parameter x, epsilon, you can make this, this uh, the, the, the difference in cost to be actually small as epsilon. So in particular, uh, again, you have to work uh, out the, 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 the algebra here, but after, after a number of steps that depend on the, this distance in cost that each time you are reducing by a factor roughly of one over n, that's how you should think about it. So clearly, after a number of steps, it will depend on n, because here you have a factor one of n, and depends on uh, this distance divided by epsilon, you can have um, the current solution is within uh, an epsilon uh, fact, uh, distance of the optimum. There's a question, Lara. Yeah. Um, is it hard to compute the circuit of greatest improvement for a given point? Very good, yes. I can anticipate the answer is yes, and we are going to, to see this in the next slide. So very good point. So anyway, uh, 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 so Doc, keep it. Doc yeah. also has a question. Yes. You should unmute yourself. Uh, yes. Hi, Laura. Um, Hi, Giacomo. So the, when you, so the, the only thing I don't understand is, so I guess these uh, sign compatible decomposition of the vectors in the kernel can be done greedily, I guess. Yes. Is that okay? So so I can start by selecting any sign compatible uh circuit, circuit yes. and okay, okay, good. Thank you. Yes. I mean you have to prove of course uh, the first thing to prove is that there exists a sign yes. compatible circuit. And once you prove that, then uh, you can you can take a I mean actually yeah not really greedy sign compatible circuit also such that the support of BG is strictly contained in the support of BV, because uh, that's somehow how you measure your progress. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, yeah, you have to, you can start greedily if you have these two conditions. Okay, thank you. There was another question, but this yes. might be answered already. So um, it's basically, is there a constructive proof of this Graves theorem? But you're saying you can do it sort of yes. greedily. Yes, yes. Good. Okay, so now the question is, when do we stop, right? So after that many iteration, we can have that the distance is at most epsilon. But uh, when actually do we stop? Uh, because I mean, you have to be careful with circuit. Circuit leads you to walk inside the polyhedron. So if you are not careful, you might not even uh, be able to converge uh, to, to an optimal solution. And actually there is a paper of Hemmeck in 2003 that shows some zigzag effect on, on circuits, so you have to be a bit careful. And that is where the parameter delta comes into play. So you, how do we choose this epsilon? So when do we stop? Well, you can choose epsilon to be one over delta square. Um, why one over delta square? So what was delta? Delta was the maximum uh, determinant of any n by n matrix. Now, uh, if all our data are integer and all, this delta is an indication on the fractionality of your extreme point. So in particular, an extreme point uh, is characterized by a submatrix of tight inequality of, uh, of rank n, and the fractionality is going to be depending on the determinant of that submatrix. So if you have two extreme points, then their fractionality will be depending on two uh, uh, determinant. So if you take the, the, the product of them, then uh, your extreme point, we have some coordinates that are integer multiple of uh, one over delta one multiplied by one over delta two, if uh, delta one and delta two are the, uh, the determinant associated to the corresponding matrix of tight constraint. So in particular, if we take the maximum and we consider delta square, uh, this means that every two extreme point, they have to, uh, to differ in, um, in the cost by at least uh, uh, an amount of one over delta square. 
So, so technically speaking, at this point, you can move to any extreme point that is not worse than, than your current solution. So if you are in the middle of your polytope, just move to any extreme point by taking any direction, could be a circuit direction, but any direction that is uh, uh, not worst. And at this point, by setting things in this way, you will be sure that this is going to be optimal. And that's basically when the parameter delta comes into play. Uh, so the, yeah. There's still a couple of questions just about the sort of the algorithmic aspects of this. Mm -hmm. So, um, so does this give uh, a weekly polynomial time algorithm for linear programming? Can one compute? Sorry, uh, a week, a weekly polynomial time algorithm for? For LP. So can one compute, uh, you know, can one implement all of this in uh, weekly yeah. polynomial time? Yeah, so this actually traces back to the previous question. So yeah. how do we select uh, the circuit? So we are going to, to, uh, to show that, that, uh, that actually in the next slide. Uh, so, okay, let me anticipate. You can turn, turn this into a polynomial algorithm if uh, immediately, if you have a weekly polynomial way to, comp to optimize over, over circuit and taking the one with the greatest improvement. Uh, we are going to show soon that this is not the case, but then, uh, yeah, you may try to approximate that. So in a way, yes, you can, but we will see that the problem of selection circuit, again, it's not that well understood. It can be reduced to another LP. And so you can solve that using an L another LP, but you're a little bit cycling here, right? Uh, so you want to solve an LP and in each time you have to use another LP to select the circuit. So that's, uh, that's not really good, but there are some cases, uh, although you could do it in weekly polynomial time, but there are some more nice polytopes for which this can actually be done combinatorially. And we are going again to see that. So let me rephrase at the moment, what we are saying is the following. If each time you could be able to take a circuit that there's the greatest improvement, then you converge uh, in, uh, in weekly polynomial time to an optimal solution. Again, why? Because the main things of circuits is that you can express this difference, the difference between the optimum and the fractional one and, and the initial one as, uh, as uh, this vector can be expressed as a sum of n vector and each of them brings you inside the polytope. This is, is actually the great thing. So at least one of them would carry a factor of one over n of distance in, uh, of the cost. So you can do this at a certain point, you have to understand when to stop because each time you're reducing by factor one over n, one over n, one over n. So at a certain point you make it very small, but how small? Well, you can, this how small, you can set it by looking at this delta square and putting things together, that's actually the bound that you get. Okay. Now, uh, let's go to your questions now that you already uh, anticipated. How hard is this problem? Okay, how hard is selecting the greatest improvement circuit? Okay, so uh, we actually show that selecting the circuit that yields the greatest improvement is unfortunately NP-hard. Do you want to guess on which polytope? Does anyone want to guess? I could give a guess, but... Okay, let's see, what would be your guess? I'm going to guess the fractional matching polytope. <laughs> yeah, easier. Easier? Yes, but, but you're right. So you, your, <laughs> uh, your answer is technically correct. Uh, match or bi on bipartite. Bipartite right? matching polytope. Uh, so already on the bipartite matching polytope, this is going to be hard. On the other hand, um, yeah, that's a bad side, but we have a very good side here. Uh, that's not too crucial because actually any uh, gamma approximation algorithm with gamma polynomial in the input side still guarantees convergence in polynomial time. And again, uh, just to give you um, an intuition. So the approximation bound, it's really a straightforward extension of the analysis that we have seen. So if we go back to the analysis, um, you see that we have this n term over here. This is because um, uh, this is because the greatest improvement was was getting an one over n factor decrease. So now, if you are not able to really find the greatest improvement, but you are able to find something that that give you gives you a gamma approximation, then you would actually carry a one over gamma n factor decrease. So you're just going to add gamma here. So that's really what you get. You can just at gamma here. So um, the fact that it is hard, um, it's not too bad because any polynomial approximation will suffice. Okay. 
Um, on the other hand, yeah, if you're curious about the hardness, actually we have seen that. It follows, we've seen that yesterday. Yesterday we had uh, shown hardness of determining whether a given extreme point has an optimal adhesion neighbor for the fractional, for the bipartite matching polytope. So do you remember that? We, we, we constructed an instance of bipartite matching polytope with an extreme point, and we said that it was hard to determine whether there was an optimal neighbor, so along, along an edge of the polytope. But we just characterized the circuit of the fractional matching polytope. And the circuit on the fractional matching polytope, they actually uh, do uh, correspond to, to the, the actual edge of the, poly of the polytope. And in particular, if you go back to, to, to uh, the, that example on bipartite matching, this means that the only circuits that you have are basically alternating path and alternating cycles. We, we have actually seen uh, how the circuit look like and, and graphically the circuit were just alternating path and alternative cycle. All the other circuits, they were involving uh, odd cycles. So you don't have that at your disposal. So really the exact same proof shows that uh, selecting the one with the greatest improvement, uh, it, it is actually NP hard. And yeah, it's just a straightforward corollary. We can repeat the corollary that we have seen yesterday from the, the standard definition of edge direction. So finding the shortest monotone circuit path to an optimal solution, actually either monotone or non-monotone, is going to be NP hard and hard to approximate within a factor of better than two. And this means that unless P is equal to NP, for any efficient pivoting rule, a circuit augmentation algorithm cannot reach the optimal solution with a minimum number of augmentation. You have to take at least twice that many. And again, let me stress, can we push this? I think it would be interesting to push this farther. But anyway, staying here with the, with the algorithmic aspect that you guys asked before, what are we getting? Uh, well, we are getting a bad news, but it's not really bad because if you, have a, if you can have a gamma approximation, then actually you would be fine. And so this actually now is going to uh, raise a natural question. Can a maximal augmentation along an edge direction be a good approximation of a greatest improvement circuit direction? So if you could prove this, so we know that, uh, we know that, um, okay, I wanted to cancel this a bit. We know that moving along greatest improvement um, circuit augmentation leads us to, to an optimal actual extreme point in weakly polynomially many steps. So this could kind of try to provide a way to, to say something about working on the edge on the polytope. If you could show that an edge direction is somehow a good approximation of, of, uh, of this circuit direction, uh, then you would be able to kind of uh, carry over the previous bound. Does it make sense? Yes, I think so. Okay. Um, so, also, just to mention, Laura, I forgot yes. to say at the very beginning, uh, if you want to take a short break at some point, at some oh. good moment, feel free. But it's yeah, a okay. So, when uh, I think we will do the, the uh, we'll finish this this aspect here, and then I think it would be good to, to take a short break, maybe, if you guys want. Um, anyway, so... Uh, so that's also the message I would like to, to convey. This is one, one uh, aspect of this, of this uh, old circuit framework that, uh, that, that, that I like. Maybe they could be exploited in a way to, to make conclusion about algorithm instead only taking edge direction, maybe be a disconnection. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it is clear that we cannot really hope to have this good to be something like the dimension, something very, very small. Because recall the previous example. Here you could stretch the polytope, you could get the polytope to be very high. And, and again, if you take an edge direction here, you, you, you're stuck with taking really a small step. And instead with circuit, uh, you could go really, really far. So in general, this uh, has to have some parameters that depend somehow internally on, on, on the polytope, like uh, how the polytope looks like. You cannot just look, as I said, for example, and, and the, the number of, of inequality or, or, uh, or, then, or the dimension. Um, on the other hand, yeah, if you stare a little bit at this example, uh, that basically 
seems to say that okay depend we, we have not defined good depends on which is your objective but uh, but for example the, the the dimension here could not be a good a good way to stick to to have an approximation like a, an, an approximation for example but if you say a little bit uh, on the this is because as i said you can imagine to stretch the polytope right and and then uh, this could bring you very far but instead these edges here they are not bringing you very far on the other hand, what could be a set of polytopes which this argument would fail? Well, if you think a little bit about it, this is going to fail for zero one polytope, like this argument of, for example, saying oh, we are stretching the polytope. So interestingly, the, the answer to this question over here is going to be, well, is going to be yes for zero one polytope. And that's what I would like to, 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 discuss, uh, to discuss next. So in particular, um, this is going to be yes, if we look at an edge direction that is called the steepest edge direction. So a steepest edge direction is an edge direction that actually maximize the following, C transpose XG divided by the one norm. So if we take um, the circuit and we, we, we actually divide it, normalize it according to the one norm, this is going to be called uh, steepest edge. Uh, and we will see that for steepest edge direction, we are actually going to be able to give an, an approximation of a circuit augmentation. And so this is then is going to give us an, a nice bound on, uh, on an edge augmentation algorithm. Um, yeah, okay, so we can have a short break now if, if, if you want and if people want. Um, um, yeah, because also we are one hour, we are in the middle, right? Yeah, I think that's a good, uh, good moment. Okay, uh, anyway, uh, let me ask, is the plan clear? So what we're going to do now, now we are going to, to uh, uh, next, like we are going to focus on zero one polytope and show that for zero one polytope, we are going to have a good approximation of greatest improvement circuit dimension. Uh, do you have questions? Okay, then, uh, um, yeah, how long will, is the break going to be, Neil? That's up to you. Uh, five minutes, ten minutes? Okay, we can have uh, five minutes. I think that's, uh, that would be good for me. Perfect. Good. All right, go ahead. Okay, good. So let's see what can we say on uh, zero one polytope using this framework. Let's step a little bit uh, back. Let's give me some more context here. So zero one polytope, of course, uh, they are fundamental importance in optimization. And indeed, uh, we mentioned uh, yesterday that for them, actually the diameter is linear in the sense that uh, actually the Hirschbaum here holds. So you, you can kind of uh, ask yourself, okay, so here we know for a fact that the diameter is, is uh, linear. Actually, does this translate somehow into a, a nice pivoting rule for the simplex algorithm for finding an optimal solution? And I think that this is a very interesting question, of course. Now, one thing I want to stress, a lot of things are known about zero one polytope, and in particular, a path of strongly polynomial length to an optimal solution on, on, on the one skeleton of this polytope can be constructed from any augmentation oracle. If you, gave, if you have any augmentation oracle that each time, for example, you give an extreme point and provides you a better extreme point, then you can actually use this to construct path of strongly polynomial length that goes to, to an optimal solution. 
And this was known uh, since uh, the 90s with the results of Schuswell, Mantes, and Ziegler, and actually recently it's been extended to Kalatis, Polito, by Delphi and Michini. Uh, on, on the other hand, uh, here, uh, what happens in, um, in these works is that you are going to uh, use a, a technique on, on, I mean, many techniques, but in particular, you would do some uh, scaling on your objective function. So you're going to feed uh, the, the oracle with, uh, with a, a slightly different objective function that becomes, uh, is, a, that is approximating your original objective function. So in each step, the, the objective function that you are considering in each step is very slightly. You can still want to ask whether there is instead a natural kind of natural pivoting rule for the simplex algorithm that uh, that guarantees the same thing. So uh, if you, I mean, don't change the objective function, you just uh, at each extreme point uh, look at the current uh, value of your neighbors, the one that you see at least, and try to see whether there is a, a nice rule that makes you uh, arrive to an optimal solution in uh, in uh, polynomial time. And for pivoting rules like uh, you know the one that we've seen uh, uh, so far, for example, dancing greatest improvement in steam stage, actually strongly polynomial bounds on the number of distinct basic feasible solutions generated by the simplex algorithm are known for zero one LP in the standard equality form. Uh, and uh, yeah, you can see uh, the, the results uh, Kitahara and Mitsuno, Kitahara Matsui and Mitsuno on uh, recently Blancard de Lovera and, and Lobo. Uh, let me say that these are results for NLP in standard equality form. So it means that you have um, equality constraints other than non-negativity. You might say, okay, if I have an LP that is not in standard equality form, I can always translate it into an LP in standard equality form by adding slack variables. But you have to be careful because the slack variables are not going to be zero one, not necessarily. So you cannot uh, arbitrarily take this result and extend it to arbitrary LP that are not in standard equality form. And also, uh, yeah, again, uh, this is a strongly polynomial bound on the distinct uh, number of basic feasible solutions generated by the simplex. So basically of the number of extreme point visited. Uh, again, uh, this is not saying, um, it's not taking into account the general C. We'll go back to that later. So in this context, what can we say with respect to the, to the previous framework? Like, can we say something more? Can we add something more if we consider this uh, uh, circuit approximation um, using edge of your polytope? And so that's uh, the, the theorem that we are going to see now. It says the following. For a vertex of uh, 0, 1 LP, a maximal augmentation along the steepest edge direction is going to give you an N approximation of a greatest improvement circuit augmentation. Okay, so this I want to stress. Here we're using the edges, but these are going to give us an approximation of a greatest improvement circuit augmentation. And okay, intuition, why is this going to be true? Uh, we can do it as follows. So supposed to have um, an LP, which is a zero one LP, which is the following, maximize C transpose X such that uh, C transpose Y such that Y is in B, and suppose that X is your vertex. Now consider the following optimization problem, okay? Um, I'm taking the objective function here. I want to maximize C transpose Z. And now I'm only asking the following. I'm not asking Z to be a circuit uh, but, or, or an edge or something. I'm just asking the following. I want a vector Z, which has norm at most one, and such that if I move along that direction, I am going to be staying inside my polytope, okay? So basically I'm asking if I'm looking at all vectors of norm uh, at most one, such that when I move along them, I'm inside my polytope, uh, let's take one that, uh, that maximize my objective function. Okay, now this is an optimization problem. Uh, which kind of optimization problem is this? So the first thing to observe is that the feasible region here, it is actually um, a polytope. So the feasible region given by these two set of conditions here, they are actually can be translated as a linear inequality. Why? Well, the first constraint, um, sorry, I mixed this two, this should be a two, constraint two, and this should be a one. Okay. So this constraint here, uh, these are just uh, describing the feasible cone at X. I'm just asking for all the directions in which I can move from X. 
So, so this is just described with the feasible cone at X. So this can be described as finite set of linear inequality. And constraint one is basically say that I want a vector with norm one. And actually this can be written in this way. Uh, you can consider a vector V, every possible vector V that just takes one and minus one um, coordinates. And you can say V, tra uh, v transpose Z less than or equal to one. So this is a way to translate this. This is the so-called cross polytope. So here we are intersecting the cross polytope with our feasible code. So this is a polytope. And so this will have an optimal solution that uh, actually is at one of its extreme point. And now one thing to, uh, to notice is that a steepest edge direction is going to be an optimal solution of this optimization problem over here. Uh, why is this true? Because this follow because X is a zero one vector. So since X is a zero one vector, only one constraint of the cross polytope can be a facet. And once again, let's give an intuition what's happening here. So we have um, this type of constraints. Uh, so we have this type, uh, sorry, we have this type of constraints. And this is actually a cone. Okay, and then we have this type of constraints and this is the cross polytope. The cross polytope is actually uh, here depicted in this way. Now, uh, since X is a zero one vector, so every coordinate, it is either one or zero. So if you look at the direction in which you could move for, for every coordinate, if the coordinate is a zero, then it can only increase. If the coordinate is at one, then it can only decrease. But you, can, you cannot have uh, an entry that for which there are some direction in which its value can increase and some direction for which its value can decrease because X is a zero one vector. So what's happening is that it's like here, this cone is completely inside one orthant here. Uh, in this case, I just put it the all the positive one, meaning that probably at this X, the two coordinates are, are all zero, so they can only increase. But if one can increase and one can decrease, then you would be in, in, in some other orphant here. But no matter how, that's basically the picture that describes, describes this setting. So what's gonna happen is that only one constraint of the cross polytope is really going to intersect your cone. So only one constraint of the cross polytope can be a facet. So what it means is that in an optimal solution here, uh, so basically you will have n minus one um, constraint that other than, uh, than the cross polytope that have to come from the cone. And so in particular, this is going to be an edge. So in this case, an optimal solution of this optimization problem here is going to be uh, an edge direction. And, and again, uh, it's going to be a, a steepest edge direction because you can assume that this is going to be equal to one. So either the optimal solution of this LP is zero, it means you don't move, and that would mean that your current x is optimal, or if not, then you can always scale it to, to have a, a z equal to one, and one norm equal to one. So basic message here, uh, a steepest edge direction is an optimal solution of this optimization problem. Now, why is this good with respect to a circuit? Well, because actually here we are in this optimization problem, we are not making any constraint for the Z to be circuit, not circuit, this happened with any vector. So in particular, um, uh, a circuit, a greatest improvement, the circuit direction is going to give us a feasible solution here. And, and now the question is, uh, can we use this to bound uh, the length step? Uh, that, that the progress that we are going to make, whether we use a circuit or whether we use steep stage. So here, suppose that Z tilde, e, and in particular multiplied by factor alpha, is the greatest improvement in circuit dimension at X. So assume that Z tilde is a norm one. What this is saying is, is that if you move from Z along a greatest improvement circuit, you can move by alpha Z tilde, okay? And instead, Z star is our steepest edge augmentation. And if you move along Z star by some fact, by factor alpha star, that's the augmentation that we are going to take at X. That's how much you can move according to the edge, and that's how much you, you can move according to, to, to Z tilde. So basically, this is our X. 
uh, here we have x star, z star, and here we have z tilde, okay? Okay, both of these vector have norm one. So um, in particular, also the objecting function, if I ignore alpha star, the objecting function of z star, C transpose z star, is clearly greater than the objecting function of C transpose z tilde, because both z star and z tilde are feasible solution here. So the reason why at x, the greatest improvement uh, selected the z tilde instead of z star is because is because alpha star because here you can move probably longer than how much you can move here okay because if you just look at c transport z z transport z would be better because it has a better uh, objective function value so so then the question if uh, i mean if you replace alpha star with alpha star over alpha which is how much you would move according to z tilde multiplied by alpha. So this now becomes the greatest improvement the circuit augmentation. And the question is, if instead we move uh, according to z star with alpha, how much is this factor? So th this is actually the factor that you are losing if you select z star instead of z tilde. Because in, they both norm one at the moment. So in terms of cost, z star would be better but z tilde probably makes you going farther with respect to, to, to z star. And this farther is expressed by, by this alpha and alpha star. So how much is this quantity? Well, you are inside the zero one polytope. So you are at an extreme point and you, want, you, are moving, you are moving according to z star to another extreme point according to this vector that has a norm of one. So you have to move at least by one. So alpha star has to move at least by one until you hit another zero one polytope. On the other hand, if you go along any vector inside your polytope, in particular, if you go along the greatest improvement circuit, you are going here along a vector that has a norm of one, and you have to stay inside zero one polytope. So how far can you go? You cannot have alpha more than n, because if alpha is more than n, there would be some coordinates in z tilde that is at least one over n, because it's a zero one polytope. So if you go more than n, you would exceed your zero one polytope. So then this factor here can, has to be greater than or equal to one over n. And so this shows that the improvement that you get uh, once you go along a steepest edge, um, um, a steepest edge direction is at least one over n the improvement that you get if you go along a greatest uh, improvement circuit augmentation. Uh, do you have a question here? Okay, that's, that's good. So if we combine the previous theorems, we get the following. For 0, 1 LP, moving along the steepest edge yields an optimal solution for an initial extreme point in strongly polynomial number of steps. And again, why is that? If you do the things like blindly, just combine the bounds. Before we had this bound of n log d, this cost. Now you have an n approximation. So if you, if you, you can have another factor of n here. And uh, on the other hand, uh, so this again will depend weakly polynomially on this bound, but uh, you can improve this analysis because you are on zero one polytope. And so you can be improved relying on the technique of Frante Tardos to make the above number strongly polynomial. This is kind of standard um, uh, techniques, I would guess by now to make this, this number strongly polynomial. But one thing that I want to highlight is that you can use that to improve the analysis. You do not have to change any parameter on your, on your LP. You don't have to change the objecting function with this uh, Diophantine approximation things. You don't have to do that for real. You can use it in the analysis to give a strongly polynomial bound, but you do not have to do it for real. For real, uh, uh, you, can, uh, you can just uh, from look at, uh, at the steepest edge direction and going over there. Now, uh, one important thing to highlight is that, okay, so it follows from, um, uh, from here that, uh, yeah, a steepest edge direction is a solution of this LP, so, so you, ca you could actually uh, compute the steepest edge direction in polynomial time, but again, 
it's again an LP, so um, it would be way better if uh, you can you could change this steepest edge. Uh, I mean, you could obtain this steepest edge direction in a more combinatorial way. And um, yeah, in this respect, I have to say that for simplex algorithm, moving at the moving to an adjacent vertex does not necessarily mean moving to an adjacent basis because of degeneracy. And, and so our result says you have to go along the steepest edge direction. So you, you have to be able to see all your neighbor. And actually my student, Sean Caffrey, has an example where if you just look at the basis and, and try to move to the steepest, uh, uh, in the steepest direction according to the basis, a certain point this might lead you to not see what is really the steepest edge neighbor. Uh, so how to deal with degeneracy is, is all another different story here. Of course, a trivial corollary is that for non-degenerate zero one polytope, then the simplex method really with a pure um, pivoting rule, like just take steepest edge. Uh, if it's non degenerate there are, uh, there are polynomially many neighbor, actually the many neighbor, so you can, uh, you can actually find it easily. And then this reaches an optimal solution in strongly polynomial time. Um, again, if, uh, if you have degeneracy, you can still reach an optimal solution here with the strongly polynomial many steps, but you would, uh, would have to really find this deepest edge um, by looking at all the neighbors. So again, you can model this as an LP, but um, yeah, I mean, pure, like pure pivoting rule this way, I mean, of course they are way nicer. So it would be good to, to kind of, uh, get something, uh, being able to say something uh, in presence of degeneracy. So, okay. clear, Clara, okay. so it's uh, open whether the steep, uh, steepest edge pivot rule uh, is strongly polynomial for... Uh, so, so, um, so again, like this steepest edge rule uh, comes from, uh, this is... I mean the like the, the basis, the basis, yeah. uh, the basis. Uh, yes, I don't, uh, I don't know. The basis, I don't know. Like, uh, um, it could be that. The, so, my student, as I said, is an example that that leads you to uh, to a different extreme point that is not a Stephen neighbor, but maybe it's not that bad <laughs> compared to to anyway the compared to where you should you were supposed to be. So, actually, that I don't know. Good. Um, Okay, now just, uh, okay, the last uh, maybe 15 minutes, um, uh, a few things to say about the circuit diameter that I promised before. So one easy corollary of all these algorithmic results that you have seen is that you can have a weakly polynomial bound on the circuit diameter of rational polyhedra. And why is that? Well, because, you know, you remember before we showed that with a circuit augmentation algorithm, if you use the greatest improvement circuit direction, you can reach an optimal solution in weekly polynomially many steps. And yeah, then the question is how you compute uh, this, uh, this circuit augmentation. But if you talk about the diameter, you don't care about that. And so in particular, put informally, uh, you can use the previous results to show that there exists a polynomial function that bounds above the circuit diameter of any rational polyhedra with M facets and, uh, and maximum encoding length of a coefficient in its description equal to, to alpha, this basically encodes the weekly polynomiality and M is the number of facets. And that's actually, it's very easy, easy to prove. If you have two extreme point, you can construct an objective function vector by adding the rows of the tight constraints for Z. And the, well, once you do this, then Z becomes the unique optimal solution. So you then uh, consider the optimization problem according to this objective function with Y as a starting point, Z as the final point, and you really apply the, the, the bound that we have seen before. So that's actually kind of good. And again, we also discussed this a little bit yesterday. I mean, maybe it, this could help for maybe showing, it's a way that shows that maybe this could help for showing some uh, weekly polynomial bound on the normal diameter if you are able to to maybe work out this approximation along, along the edges. Um, and last thing that I wanted to say is that, um, yeah, so this is good. Uh, can we actually exploit this kind of circuit diameter things to get maybe some other new insight on, on some other long standing conjectures about diameters in the literature? And this brings to, to the last thing that I wanted to mention 
that is related to the TSP polytope. So what is the TSP polytope? The DSP polytope is given by the convex hull of characteristic vectors of Hamiltonian cycles in a complete undirected graph. I want to stress that for the TSP polytope, the graph is complete. So you have an undirected graph, which is complete, and uh, you take the characteristic vector of whole Hamiltonian cycles, and the convex hull is the TSP polytope. The study of the diameter, here we talk about combinatorial diameter, for the TSP polytope as kind of a long history, and in particular, uh, already in 74, Parberger Rao showed that actually the asymmetric TSP polytope, so the one that you have when you consider directed graph, has diameter of two. So it's pretty small, the diameter is pretty small. And actually, if you go and have a look at that paper, there is something interesting that, uh, that they say, and also goes back to a, a few questions that uh, I got yesterday. Uh, interesting, they say, if we can indeed take the diameter of a polytope as a measure of the computational complexity of the combinatorial problems that he models. And, uh, and then he says, an hypothesis that appear to be generally accepted, okay, uh, at that time, uh, our result seems to indicate that there may go exist good algorithm for a large class of problem. Now, of course, uh, I mean, I guess nowadays um, the hypothesis is not really generally accepted, uh, but anyway, it was kind of interesting. So at that time, uh, they were trying to, uh, they, they wonder whether the diameter of the polytope could give an indication of how good is the, the, the problem, um, how good, algorithms could be to solve the problem. So if there was a link with how able you are able to, to solve the problem with the diameter of the associated polytope. And okay, so that was for the asymmetric TSP when the graph is directed. And actually, um, Gretchen and Parberg in uh, 86, so it's more than 30 years ago, they conjecture that the same should be true also for the TSP polytope, so the undirected uh, counterpart. So uh, they conjecture that also that the diameter is two. And let me say that this conjecture is still open after more than, than 30 years. Okay, so what is the best bound? The current best known bound is more than 20 years old and it's due to Rispoli and Cosares. They, they show that the diameter of the GSP polytope is at most four. And let me say that, um, yeah, the, the result is it's very, very nice and, uh, and only uses a combinatorial argument which I like a lot. So um, again, like you are given a polytope, you like to say something about the diameter, this polytope uh, has a combinatorial interpretation because it is the TSP, which adjacency relations do they use? Um, unfortunately, Papa Dimitri showed that testing with a two SP tool are adjacent is currently complete. So you cannot hope to have a characterization of adjacency for extreme points of the TSP. Let me stress that this is not um, uh, true in general for NPR problem. There are uh, NPR combinatorial problems for which testing adjacency of the string points can be done in polynomial time. So they are not directed uh, link this, uh, these two things. Um, so what they do, they exploit adjacency for the perfect two matching polytope. And what is that? A perfect two matching is a set of edges such that each node is incident into exactly two edges of F. So it's a generalization of matching in which you, you have uh, two edges incident on each node. And clearly a TSP tool is a perfect to matching because it is actually just a cycle. And, and so it is a perfect to matching that in addition, it is also connected, okay? So, um, Similarly to what we've seen for the matching polytope, if you go back to that proof, it really easily generalized to the two matching polytope, the two perfect matching polytope. And so you can show that uh, two perfect matching M1 and M2 are adjacent if and only if the symmetric difference contains a unique alternating cycle. So by now we should be familiar with this uh, kind of uh, techniques. And the above yields a sufficient adjacency condition for two TSP tour because two TSP tour uh, are two um, perfect matchings. And so like if this condition is satisfied, it means that they are uh, adjacent uh, for the perfect two matching polytope. And so they, they have to be adjacent for the TSP polytope too. And so they are basically uh, going to exploit this. And um, 
okay, I can uh, try to just give uh, a very brief idea. This is just a sketch for an event. Things are a little bit more complicated in reality. But uh, th the main idea that they, they explore is are as follows. So if you have a TSP tour, then a TSP tour can be seen as the disjoint union of two perfect matchings, if any is even, because it is going to, uh, to be an even cycle and, and it will decompose naturally into two perfect matchings. Okay, the key lemma that they show is that if you have two tour that have one perfect matching in common, then the distance between the corresponding extreme points is at most two. The reason is that if you have two tours and they have a perfect matching in common, when you take the symmetric difference, you are left with a bunch of even cycles. Uh, because uh, because for, for every TSP, remove one matching, then you're back with one matching. So basically, if you remove the matching in common, the two TSP reduces to two perfect matching. So when you take the symmetric difference, you're going to have a bunch of, of even cycles. And so since the graph is complete, the underlying graph, what they show is that you can actually combine this set of even cycles in such a way that we, you, you can uh, basically change from one to another by using large uh, alternating cycle and this gives you basically a bound of two on the extreme point. But uh, I mean, again, this needs to prove, I'm just giving a, a, a sketch. Uh, but uh, basically what they then shows is that if you have two tours and, and let's say that these two tours are given as this is T1 and it is the union on M1 and M2, and then you have T2, which is the union of N3 and N4. When they show is that they can find another perfect matching M, such that M1 with M is a tour, and M3 with M is also a tour. So basically, they 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 show that they combine they can combine perfect matchings in such a way that they could have this kind of tour, and this gives already a bound of six because if you take these two tours, they are going to have M1 in common, and so the distance is at most two. Then you can take these two tours, they are going to have M in common, and so again, the bound is at most two. And then they take these two tours, and they are going to have M3 in common. And so the bond is again two. So if you put things together by exchanging perfect matching and relying on uh, uh, two perfect matching types of adjacency, they can show that you have a bound of six. And after this, they improve it to four by selecting M in a little bit more careful way so that the first and the last step uh, reduce to be one simple cycle. But everything is very combinatorial and really they, they, it relies on exchanging each time perfect matching. That's the, the main me message. Main message they are exploiting this type of adjacency and then they exploit the perfect matching theory behind that to use this uh, kind of construction nicely. They also state in their paper, um, uh, although they do not really give the example, so that I cannot give it to you, but they state that uh, four is the best possible if you always exchange perfect matching. It's basically they, they do here. They are trying to find a perfect matching, and then from, from, uh, from this one to this one, they are basically exchanging M2 with M. From this one to this one, they are exchanging M1 with M3, and these are all perfect, perfect matching. And they said, if you really stick to this, you cannot hope to, to, to improve and prove a diameter of two, because uh, there are examples in which you need at least three steps. Okay. Now, why is, how is this relating? Um, I mean, this is anyway in, uh, kind of uh, nice to know, but uh, uh, why am I saying this in the constant of circuit diameter? Is because, of course, you can ask the following. Does the bound of two hold for the circuit diameter? So circuit diameter is kind of a relaxation. So it's always at most the combinatorial diameter. So uh, we, it's a natural question to ask, does, it, does this bound hold if we consider the circuit diameter instead? And in fact, the answer is yes. And this is a joint work with Sean Kaffer and uh, Kasantin Spaskovic from University of Ottawa a couple of years ago. 
the circuit diameter of the TSP polytope uh, actually satisfies the bound of two, and actually even more, the diameter is always going to be one, uh, unless the number of vertices is five, for which, uh, for which in this case, uh, the, uh, the circuit diameter is, uh, is two. And um, okay, like I don't think there is too much instructive in, in, in really the proof itself of this, of this theorem, but uh, what I would like to emphasize is maybe what it is suggesting, what it could be suggesting for, for the combinatorial diameter. So um, we don't have a description of the TSP polytope, so um, which circuits are we going to use? So the main thing is that, uh, so if you have two TSP tour, let's consider K1 and K2 to be the characteristic vectors. The key point is then uh, if n is different from five, then key two minus key one, so just moving directly from, uh, from T1 to T2, is going to be a circuit of the TSP polytope. And that's why you always have a bound of one. Basically, this is saying if you take two extreme points, there is always a circuit that lets you connect to one of them. And as I said, we don't really have a description of the TSP polytope. So which are the inequality that we're going to, to use to, to actually uh, uh, infer that there is a circuit between them. And we actually use the following set of inequality. We consider the sub two relaxation um, due to dancing Fulkerson and Johnson that basically is given by these constraints plus non-negativity. And if you wonder what this constraint says, uh, it's a, a natural relaxation for the TSP. You want at most two edges for every node. And then uh, these are basically inequality that are trying to enforce connectivity. So if you take uh, any subset of vertices, so cardinality less than or equal to number of nodes minus two, this is saying that basically you can have at most cardinality of S minus one edges um, inside uh, the graph induced by this subset of S, uh, because basically you don't want to have subcycles. So, so this is trying to say that what you should have, you should have at most like a spanning tree. So this is a pretty well known relaxation for uh, for the TSP. And in addition, we are going to use a certain additional set of inequality, which are called the comb inequality, and uh, these are due to Gretchen and Par Parvin seventy nine. Um, okay, so we only use comb inequality of a fixed size, so in particular of size six. Um, it is not too important to describe, this can be generalized, that it's not too important here. Uh, in this case, what this is saying is basically the following. Uh, if you have six nodes that behave, uh, if you have six nodes, u, v, w, u prime, v prime, w, then if you look at this structure over here, you sum the values of all the edges associated to here, and this should be at most four. And why is that? If you think about it integrally, you can realize that if you take five edges, then here you will be going to violate the degree of, it, uh, of, of for at least one of this, this node. So this should be at most four. And uh, for those who are a little bit more familiar with the TSP, uh, this kind of inequality, they, they, they try to, for example, um, exclude um, fractionality like this. If this is 0 0.5, then these things are one. Uh, then uh, this kind of point satisfied this inequality over here, but it's not going to satisfy this. And if for those who are a bit uh, more familiar with TSP, uh, this is a structure of a fractional point that, that arise uh, very often. And uh, okay, so as I said, um, there is not much uh, to, to be said about this. If you, this, the proof relies on kind of a, a case analysis, I would say. And uh, if you want, um, here there is an example in which you have two TSP tour, one red and one blue. And uh, I leave it here, but uh, you can try to prove that the circuit K1 minus K2, that means you give a value of one on the red edges and of minus one for the blue one. You can try to prove that this is a circuit in the same way we were trying to proving uh, circuits for the fractional matching polytope. Uh, so here we have this, this I, I should say that all of these are fuzzy defining. 
uh, for n greater than or equal to six. So you can try to to use edges in the support and try to infer that uh, that this uh, you cannot find any other vector such that uh, B G is smaller than. Uh, the support that you would have if you consider the vector with one on the red edges and minus one on the blue one. So it's kind of, um, if we want, we can uh, go through this uh, together later, or maybe via Slack. I'll leave you an example uh, or as an exercise if you want. Um, but what I would like to emphasize is that what comes from here is, is that, you know, using some other type of facet defining inequality helps. So here, it was for us crucial to use not just the degree inequality that you would have if you think about the, perfect, uh, the two perfect matchings, but for us, it was crucial, uh, if you want to try to uh, prove that this is a circuit, to use other inequality like the subtour inequality and a subset of the comp. And so I'm not aware of any, you know, for example, try to find graphical characterization of adjacency that actually try to exploit this inequality for the normal combinatorial diameter, for the normal uh, notion of a standard notion of diameter. And so, yeah, that's the insight that I would like to convey to, to you. Like for the circuit diameter, this seems to be helpful. Uh, do they help somehow? Can one exploit it somehow? to for the, the non-standard notion of, of diameter. That's uh, the main thing that I would like to, to, to convey. And I think uh, that's, that's it. Just final remarks now. The complexity of computing a, uh, the circuit diameter of a polytope is also open right now. And even for the fractional matching polytope, it, it keeps coming back. Recall that there is a graphical characterization of the circuit of the fractional matching polytope, that they are basically the actual uh, direction of, of the polytope, uh, which is kind of nice. On the other hand, uh, we can construct instances where the circuit diameter is strictly smaller than the standard diameter value. And this is because, like, for example, if you have odd cycles, fractional cycles at the vertex, you can start moving along this type of direction so you can start you can go inside the polytope and uh, and so weird things can happen and so you can actually reduce the circuit diameter with respect to the standard diameter so in the proof that we have seen yesterday the lower bound does not hold anymore and uh, it's not going to be a lower bound still uh yeah i'm i'm not sure like i i think something could be said here i think the fractional matching is still have something to say with respect to, to the complexity of computing the circuit diameter of a polytope. And so again, we wrap up with some question that we saw from uh, yesterday. Uh, main question, polynomial here conjecture, uh, polynomial pivot group for simplex. Uh, one question that I personally like is what is the complexity of computing the diameter of a simple polytope? opens in 2003, the diameter of the TSP polytope opened since 86. And on circuits, we go back to what you said before. Um, people were asking, okay, how hard is to compute the, the best improvement circuit? That's hard. On the other hand, any polynomial approximation suffices. So um, can one develop some nice approximation or in approximability results for selecting circuits? And what is the complexity of computing the circuit diameter of a polytope? And again, yeah, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Laura. Maybe let's uh, just check if there are any questions at this point. Uh, Giacomo. Hi. Hi, Laura. Hi. So for the asymmetric TSP, so, so I think the uh, harder result is for the symmetric or does it also hold for the asymmetric? Uh, which result? Uh, sorry, the um, adjacency. Oh, right. Uh, yeah, it was for the asymmetric, for the symmetric TSP and actually I did not check whether that that I was just wondering this. if the reason why you can get a bound of two I, I don't know so because if a bound of two seems very tight so that's why I was wondering uh, how can you prove it if you cannot even uh, test if you don't even know how to characterize adjacencies uh, okay so I don't see these two things as uh, immediately related 
uh, because mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, again, it's just a bound. So you can prove, you can try to construct a path of length two, and you don't need to know that they are exactly adjacent or not. Mm -hmm. uh, like, uh, also, yeah. So I, I don't right. see it immediately. I don't see it immediately related. But actually, right. yeah, I forgot to check whether uh, because yeah, I know this this standard result for the for the symmetric TSP, mm -hmm. and actually I don't know whether whether it holds for the asymmetric TSP too. Okay. Uh, if just if you were wondering, okay, why it is so, what is so different with the asymmetric with respect to the symmetric one? Um, why here you can give a bound of two and why here you cannot give a bound of two. I'm not sure I can answer that question, but I can tell you what I tried. Um, mm -hmm. I tried to have a look here and I tried to mimic the argument on, 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 this, on, the, on the symmetric one. Why like you take a symmetric TSP, you, you, you change one undirected edge with two directed one. And then I was tracing uh, the, the, I mean, the argument here to see what was going wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, when you transmit it to in the undirected one, and the point there was that um, so you you don't have the edge in both direction. So if you want, for example, an alternating uh, path, uh, when you trace it back to the undirected one, it might not be alternating anymore because uh, because you cannot re kind of uh, reuse the direction of the edge. This is not very uh, instructive, but that was uh, uh, more or less when the argument, when you try to mimic the argument, it failed. Mm -hmm. And at the certain point, you can nicely use that you are going in one direction and, and, and instead in, uh, in the symmetric version, you don't have that. And so you cannot trace back adjacency. Okay. Okay. All right, um, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So question, um, so Cedric asked, do you know of any other circuit pivot rules which give polynomial convergence? Okay, uh, polynomial, so polynomial convergence, it depends on what you mean by, uh, by polynomial. So there are some other circuit pivot rule. For example, you can extend uh, the steepest uh, uh, edge to, to steeper circuit. And by the way, for steeper circuit, uh, depend on the definition that you use to extend it, uh, there is a polyhedral characterization of, of the circuit given by Borgen and Biss. And you can give some bound on, on how this circuit approximate uh, the, the best improvement one. And you can give bound that depends uh, on uh, some, uh, I mean, some parameter of, of the polyhedron. I'm not sure if they then effectively translate into a polynomial bound, though. Uh, good. Other questions? Uh, oh, here's one more question. Um, so finding a polynomial pivot rule for the simplex seems rather hard in general. Is there known, a known example where a polynomial pivot rule works for certain types of polytopes? Yeah, plenty. Like one, uh, the most famous one I can, uh, I can, uh, um, I, I mean, the, the, uh, you can think about, for example, uh, flow problems. Um, if you think about flow problems, uh, then if you augment flow along, uh, along uh, basically uh, augmenting path, or even if you think about the bipartite uh, uh, matching, then you are augmenting the matching along basically uh, augmenting path, and this corresponds to, to go to adjacent to vertex of the polytope. And if you take each time, for example, the, um, the augmenting path that has the minimum number of nodes, then uh, this actually corresponds to taking the, the steepest edge rule, and there you converge in, uh, in, uh, in strongly polynomial time. Good. Okay, uh, well, all right, last uh, question. Is mm -hmm. there a combinatorial abstraction of polytopes which models circuit diameter in the same way connected layer families generalize the diameter? Oh that. yeah, that's that's a very good question. Uh, actually, I I don't know. Actually, I don't know. When you talk about abstraction, I was already saying okay, connected layer family, but then no, you want that for circuit diam diameter, and uh, and that I don't know. On the other hand, I have to say, a circuit they behave a bit uh, a bit weirdly, so it's it's hard. 
to, to extrapolate uh, something combinatorial because even the combinatorial uh, structure of the polytope, uh, it affects the, the circuit diameter like we have seen. So it seems hard to get, uh, to get combinatorial abstraction. Even, uh, you know, basic things like you have an LP and you put it in standard equality form by adding uh, slack variables. This could change the set of your circuits just by the fact that you add slack variables. So it seems to be, to be hard to infer something by just looking somehow some combinatorial abstraction. But it's interesting, actually, I don't know. Good. Uh, I think let's take further questions uh, to the Slack channel. Uh, maybe, uh, Laura, can you turn yep. your camera back oh, on? Oh, sorry. Um, yes. Can I share screen? Um, I think uh, at the top you should be able to end the share screen. Okay, here I am. Uh, we can't see you yet. No, 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 I just stopped sharing the screen and now I can start the video again. Yes, okay, great. So, um, well, thanks very much, Laura. Certainly I learned uh, a lot from your lecture. Yeah, th thanks to much. all of you. Huh? And so everyone, I invite you to unmute yourselves and let's give Laura a round of applause. Thank you, Laura. Thank you.